Welcome to Migrate Canada, the podcast that explores the diverse tapestry of Canadian immigration. I'm your host, Colin Singer, and today we have a fascinating episode lined up for you with our distinguished guest, Andrew Griffith. Andrew Griffith, a luminary in the realm of Canadian policy and diversity, is not only an accomplished analyst, but also a prolific author. Drawing from his extensive experience and an exhaustive review of data from Statistics Canada, IRCC Operational Statistics, Employment Equity, and other sources, Andrew's work provides an integrated view covering economic outcomes, social indicators, and political and public service participation. Andrew's illustrious career spans three decades within the Canadian public service, including notable roles as the former Director General of the Citizenship and Multiculturalism Branch at Citizenship and Immigration Canada. His governmental publications, such as From a Trading Nation to a Nation of Traders, Toward a Second Century of Canadian Trade Development, reflect his deep insights into the nation's development. As a fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and the Environics Institute, he continues to contribute significantly to the discourse on immigration, citizenship, multiculturalism, and related issues. Join us as Andrew and I discuss Canada's three-year immigration plan for 2024-2026. If you're curious about the forces that have shaped Canada into the mosaic it is today, Andrew Griffith's insights are not to be missed. So, settle in and let's explore the multifaceted world of Canadian immigration with My Great Canada. Uh, So, Andrew, welcome to our show. Well, thanks very much for having me. So the headline here, Andrew, is that uh, November 1st, uh, the government tabled its annual report to Parliament. And in so doing, they revealed what their their annual immigration levels are for the next three years. Um, We see that since 2015, when the Liberals came into power, uh, we have seen high levels of immigration, and this has fueled rapid population growth. We recently hit the 40 million uh, mark in June of 2023, and we see that all growth in population uh, and, and, and most growth in the labor force is now coming from, from immigration. Um, we see, obviously, the latest controversies primarily in the housing affordability and, and, and housing shortages. Um, what was your take on the annual levels that we saw uh, coming uh, out of this for the next uh, three years? Well, I guess what I was wondering whether the government would do is, given the concerns over housing affordability, et cetera, whether they would actually trim the sails, so to speak, on their immigration levels. But what they did is basically maintain the projected increase over the next two years and then put a sort of a freeze for the third year, which to my mind is more of a communications exercise than a substantive one, because it's basically signaling, yeah, we hear your concerns, um, but we don't see any reason really to trim the levels. And of course, the other thing, uh, the big issue that continues to be ignored is the large number of temporary workers and students, which of course dwarfs the numbers of permanent residents coming here. So I look at it as more of a, you know, more communications, maintaining the the general plot, and in one sense, um, leaving a hard decision in 2025 for 2026, um, when possibly there'll be a new government in place. So I guess the elephant in the room really is this, what are the numbers of people coming to Canada? We have this process where they table uh, the levels and we look at these levels and we see that the economic stream is, is, uh, as it always has been for for the last number of years, um, 60% in favor of economic immigration. So the the broad strokes are 485,000 with primarily economic at 60% and and the uh, humanitarian uh, asylum and refugee and family uh, making up 
the other 40%. Those are, those are just the broad strokes. Um, but what's, what's troubling for many who really delve down into the numbers is, as you just mentioned, it, the temporary stream of people coming here is much, much larger, actually, than, uh, than the permanent admission. And so the temporary stream uh, is, is, is causing m lots of people to raise questions. Uh, is this a, a number that should have more discussion? The temporary stream, and, and your thoughts on that, Andrew? Um, absolutely. Like, I think it's really, we almost have a conceit that we have a managed immigration system that we actually manage the number of people who come to Canada. But of course, that's true with respect to permanent residents where we have the levels plan and the targets, et cetera. But the temporary is on demand. So if somebody applies for a, a permit, there's no limit, no cap or anything like that. And so that's so what's happened over the last 20 years is that number has like literally skyrocketed to be, you know, to be the major the vast majority of all people coming here. And we've seen problems in terms of uh, businesses um, using low cost uh, temporary workers to fulfill, fill positions that Canadians can't or won't do, um, as well as sort of uh, avoiding other alternatives like automation that are more, perhaps more costly in the short run. And then you have the whole, well, I would call it the education industry complex which you have the, the uh, complicity of provincial governments and uh, education institutions who are desperate for more international students to uh, address budgetary pressures, irrespective of whether those uh, students um, are coming here for education or whether they're just using it as a, almost a backdoor to become a, a, a resident of Canada. So, so you're touching on an interesting uh, point is that immigration to Canada is, has become a two-step process. Um, a lot of people getting into the stream of permanency uh, have more and more come from uh, a temporary stay in Canada, whether it's work or whether it's study. And I mean, his, many years back when you were uh, involved in, in uh, this department, uh, there was a time where we used to call Canada's program, uh, you know, the immigration permanency, a parachute program. You would be parachuting in people who had no ties to Canada and they had no experience. So over time, uh, there was a thought that people should have some uh, an anchor in Canada and the, um, the uh, success and the uh, integration levels and those measures would would increase so we we see many people now um, but who who take a, 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 a have an experience of working or studying in canada but on a, on a larger picture um, the liberal government has linked high levels of immigration with economic growth uh, especially post pandemic um, what what do critics argue uh, on this linking of high levels of immigration, uh, does the evidence is the evidence compelling that there is a link between immigration and economic uh, performance of, of our country? Well, it, the government is almost a Keynesian approach. You add more people, um, you increase demand, so therefore the economy grows. And that's correct. Nobody disputes that. But the issue is not the size of the economy, the size of the pie, it's how that gets divided. It gets in terms of what is happening with productivity and per capita economic growth. And that's where all the evidence suggests that the government is failing miserably. I think uh, you know it shows that we actually, on a per capita basis, our economy is basically, uh, if not in a recession, pretty close to one. Um, and so uh, the, all the labor economists that, uh, that I've sort of talked to or, or read about uh, think that the current approach doesn't make sense on an economic uh, basis because we're just adding more people, which of course adds more demand, but we're not addressing the more fundamental issues in terms of how well are those people doing. 
how well is are their economic circumstances? Are they contributing to the growth of the economy on a per capita basis and improving productivity? And that's where uh, uh, the current policies just are not working. So if we look at the actual temporary numbers, uh, we see the international student uh, component will this particular year seem to be in the 900,000 range and the foreign worker stream uh, of all measures will be in the approximate 700,000 uh, stream. Uh, let's let's talk about some of the challenges. Uh, let's talk to some of the challenges um, on, on the student, the international student. There's been a lot of controversy uh, in terms of the cost, uh, in, in terms of the, the component of international uh, foreign inter students who are coming here uh, and how it affects Canadian students getting into schools, obviously increased competition. There's the affordability issue uh, of housing. Um, all kinds of issues have come up, and yet we don't see any measures to really address uh, this uh this very, very significant component of what we call immigration, because it's all part of immigration. What are your thoughts? On, were you disappointed at all in, in the, uh, the silence, the, 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 the silence that, that seems to be uh, in, taking hold on, on this controversial silo? Well, I think there's a bit more discussion and a bit more debate over the uh, the numbers and the role that international students are playing. Um, first of all, I would probably distinguish between international students who go to, uh, you know, our universities and our colleges and those who go to sort of private colleges or go to secondary campuses of institutions because those are that's where more of the problems are. Like somebody goes to UBC, U of T, you know, that's probably more legitimate than somebody goes to uh, one of those uh, Niagara College uh, satellites um, because those are all, all or I would argue, are more like visa mills than education institutions. So there needs to be sort of a, a bifurcation of the international students process between designated learner institutions, which are really designated learning institutions rather than the ones who are basically providing a backdoor entry. Um, so that's the first issue. The second issue is that the government has made it easier for international students to have more work hours. There's now no longer a cap. So that's also sending a signal that, well, you can enroll, but if you don't even go to class and just work 40 hours, 50 hours a week, that's fine with us, which again is just a, it, it's a, a wrong, wrong policy because you, if you want to get students here and if you want students who will actually contribute in the longer run to our economy, you don't want the, uh, the low value added job service jobs. That's not who the, the program should be for. So I think there has to be a major rethink. I mean, there are some signals from the government that they're looking at it. But then again, of course, we'll get into uh, some of the jurisdictional issues. But I think there are ways to address that. And and fundamentally, again, I think we actually have to move to some form of, of uh, cap, restriction, whatever kind of uh, formula to uh, sort of separate the, the wheat from the chaff, if I can say that. You know, the students who are really here for education purposes, yes, by all means. But those who are really served, you know, using it as a backdoor entry, no real value to Canada. Yeah, it, it seems that this particular stream uh, is, is in some ways, uh, it's, it, it's a sub foreign worker stream uh, because we, we know, and from our experience as well, uh, there are many large employers, for example, in the food service industry, uh, they draw upon these students who are, permitted to work unlimited number of hours. So there's certainly, uh, one could, could, could think that there's a certain number of these 900,000 students whose goal is to come here temporarily and work, and they get to work through an admission to a so-called college. Uh, and then there doesn't seem to be 
a monitoring process like there is in the temporary foreign worker program there's much more of a monitoring process to uh, for for many many metrics the employers have to perform and there's a lot more uh, of enforcement and and making employers reveal how these workers are are being employed whereas in the student side of things these designated learning institutes don't have a lot of regulation so you you and i know and then we we see in certain areas of of ontario toronto greater toronto uh, there are these colleges so it seems that this particular stream the work needed is is quite significant uh, i don't have confidence that this is going to be done you know anytime soon uh, and looking at this plan that was tabled uh, it, it it certainly doesn't deal with anything on 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 the student market uh, do you have confidence that in the next two years we're going to see major changes do you see caps coming in for example uh, of some kind in the next two years I think the, I think the government is grappling with the issue I mean I think the minister has said he doesn't want caps um, but I think in the end and you know who knows whether uh, an incoming change of government would would institute caps but I think it gets to the in part to the jurisdictional issue. So I don't think the feds could really realistically manage assessing designated learning institutions. I don't think they have the competence, the knowledge, the networks. But you could actually institute sort of provincial caps. So you could sort of say, like, uh, you know, like we do with the provincial nominee program. There's there's so numbers there. And then you let the provinces figure out what they want to do. Right. How they're going to do that. And you know, you you assume that provincial governments uh will be responsible enough that if you actually start sort of saying you have to choose um, you know, let's say well, you know, this year sort of it's like nine hundred thousand. Well let's say two years from now we want to be down to six hundred thousand. Yeah, what just for the sake of argument. You divide it up, and then say, and that'll serve for us the governments of each provincial government to serve. Say, okay, do we want to favor students who are more in the high value added, you know, productivity stream for the sake of argument, or do we want to serve keep on using it as a crutch for uh, uh, the service industry? So I think I think there's I think there's a need to do that. I don't see yet uh, an, any sort of sign of a consensus because part of the problem is that so the provincial governments have largely relied or many have relied on international students to prop up the education institutions so you know they're not going to like this and you've seen some signs again when uh, the, the minister suggested that possibility and then of course um the institution the institutions themselves are looking, you know, particularly the ones that, uh, you know, the, the private colleges or some of the community colleges that have established secondary institutions, uh, they're going to fight like anything. But I still think, you know, the government needs to address it. And I think we need to move towards some form of caps or cap and trade or, you know, something that actually sort of provides some limits and some controls. So they were actually ensuring that we're actually getting, you know, um, if not the best and the brightest, um, at least they're closer to, to that group. It's interesting that a lot of, of the way this program is sold overseas is uh, it, it, there's, there's discussion and linkage to being able to stay permanently. But when we actually look at the numbers of people who become permanent residents from the study stream, it's very, very low. Uh, I think it's, it's probably uh, it's less than 15% of permanent residents are, are coming from from the study stream uh, and i think it's being oversold by uh, agents in the field um, and and people get here and then they find out that this uh, this experience in canada is not going to give them the competitiveness that they need to be a, 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 a strong express entry candidate which is the pool of uh, where permanent residence comes uh, for for most uh, of these students uh, on on the employment side of things 
um, do you see do you see the word caps coming in at any point in time? Uh, it, it seems logical, and I I, I look to the United States where uh, in uh, 2022, uh, just looking at the number of, of, of foreign workers in Canada, it was 700,000 approximately. It's very hard to get the exact number. Um, but in 2022, the USA has uh, had 984,000 temporary workers across all their streams, and they have specific caps on all of them. And it seems to me that we have uh, levels, we don't use the word caps, we have levels for permanent. Uh, it seems to me that there, it would make sense to have a limitation uh, on uh, the numbers of temporary workers in Canada as well. What are your thoughts? I agree. I mean, I think it's, it's you know, like it, the problem with the demand, well, the advantage of a demand driven program like temporary workers is that it responds to the needs and the wants of the business community. So it has a real advantage, has the flexibility, everything like that. On the other hand, it doesn't provide incentives for companies to invest in productivity improvements, to invest in automation, to invest in other technologies or other approaches that help them address their labor market needs. Um, and so when I look at some of the stuff that I see from the US, you can sort of see that even in agriculture, there's more investment in terms of automated picking machinery and things like that um, because there is a cap. So that forces um, uh, industry to adapt and to innovate. So I really think that uh, just allowing business to say we want more, I think is irresponsible because again, it doesn't help address that fundamental issue of lagging Canadian productivity vis-a-vis -vis most other G7 countries. This is this is a controversial area as well because obviously, uh, if the I mean there are there there the government would have to give some help in the automation for companies that invest. There would be some kind of formula tax credits and and such for this kind of investment. It wouldn't be all shouldered by uh, employers and and again. Uh, you know, you, agriculture is certainly an area where uh, there's been a, a lot of automation. Uh, I'm not sure where Canada stands in that, uh, in terms of how it ranks, uh, you know, in automation. But uh, that's something that that we we could look at, uh, maybe perhaps later. But um, I, I see political issues uh, in in moving towards caps, and uh, we've talked in the past about jurisdictional overreach. Um, you know, if Ottawa tries to go too far, there's a lot of shared jurisdiction. And obviously, uh, foreign workers, we deal with employers, you're dealing with opposition from business councils and employers. Um, but it leads me to thinking, uh, uh, in terms of devising numbers um, and, and, and looking at the benefit economically to Canada, uh, are we, we're now questioning uh, whether the calculation and the valuation uh, that that immigration brings does it lead to improved economics uh, of our country? Uh, are we moving to a new, perhaps a new system uh, of of how we go about selecting immigrants? Well, I mean, if the, the government keeps on adjusting things to try and address, or you know, where they perceive their labor shortages, like health care, the trades, etc. Um, and so express entry has started to evolve from where it was sort of maybe a, a general pool of highly qualified or more skilled immigrants to one that has sort of targeted pools. Some of the labor economists are a bit skeptical of that approach um, because they say the government is always a bit too little too late in terms of predicting demand and uh, responding to demand. But you can certainly make a case, you know, uh, in terms of giving some priority to healthcare and to trades. Um, and you could also make a case that maybe we need fewer university graduates or university uh, professionals and more people in trades. You know, so you can make those kind of cases. But it's very complex to manage and it's very hard to get it right. And in many ways, 
one of the reasons for the provincial nominee program was to address those needs because the provinces are closer to the realities on the ground and are a better place to do that. So maybe that's just something you just leave to the provinces. And again, when you're dealing with regulated professions, for example, the provinces hold all the regulatory levers because all the councils and everything like that are province-based. So maybe it makes more sense to sort of, you know, just focus the PNP on, on those c candidates and the feds should try and be a bit less ambitious in terms of trying to address specific skill needs. Well, that, that, that touches a bit on, you know, foreign credentials because it's so regulated, um, all these occupation and, and these sub professions, uh, regulated by the provinces and managing a, a standardized system, uh, of, of credentialing and, uh, assessing, you know, professionals from abroad, this has always been a challenge getting people here. And, and some of the provinces, even in the medical professions, uh, getting some standardized, it's very, very difficult to get all the provinces online. And then, uh, it, it's certainly medical professionals. I, we've seen the barriers. I wouldn't say they've, they've been, uh, reduced, but, uh, some of the provinces, because the, the, the critical need for, let's say, family physicians is, is so intense across Canada, uh, we're now seeing some of the provinces uh, becoming more lenient in, in some of the areas and uh, some of the measures that they were previously looking at. Um, so it's, it's, it's easier, for example, to go practice as a family physician in, in the province of Manitoba. Uh, Ontario has, has become a bit more lenient. Uh, but overall, uh, this area of recognizing foreign credentials and finding a way to st standardize it so people can predict where they can go. And this is, this is a, a problem that's just not, it's not improving. It's, it hasn't been solved. And I have doubts when you now look at the provinces to, uh, come together with policies for w temporary workers managing all of this it seems quite daunting to me. It doesn't seem to be uh, something that's going to be solved anytime soon. Certainly not with this government. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I remember this is, and it may be dated now. I remember, sir, you know, listening to briefings on sir foreign credential recognition from this is like 10, 15 years ago. And it always struck me. It was all about process and there was nothing really happening on the ground. So I'm more of the view that sure have, you know, federal provincial discussions on this issue, but the real action happens at the provincial level. So it would be nice to have consistent standards of across the country, but is it really worth putting a lot of effort into that? So let's say if, you know, Manitoba is doing this, Ontario is doing that. And I think they're good examples to do that. I think BC is also doing something like that. Just let that happen because the feds will can't control it the feds can encourage information sharing and things like that uh, but i i think it's just one of those process discussions that you get bogged down in and in the meantime you're seeing from the provinces how they're addressing it and you'd like to think that the advantage of a federation is that you allow different approaches in the provinces and uh people learn from each other because if it's working in ontario other provinces may take note and say, wait a minute, we're losing out. Uh, well, this is what of, happens. This is what happens. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's my take. I mean, I'm sort of saying the federal role, you know, it's like, how long have we been talking about removing uh, provincial barriers to trade? It, it's, it's an ongoing, it, it, it never, it never stops. Uh, and so expecting uh, Ottawa to be fixing all, all of these challenges is it's just not it, it's not reasonable it's it's not Ottawa's problem to fix by itself um, and and but at, problematically the numbers of people coming to Canada Ottawa controls that uh, so there uh, th this is something that needs to be looked at in terms of uh, and I like the, the, the concept of caps uh, for for reasons we've already we we all will know. Um, in terms of the housing affordable, that's where people start raising their arms. And that's why the narrative, it seems, 
on high levels of immigration, the 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 narrative is changing. Canadians, and, and it seems clear, Canadians are not in favor of continued high levels of immigration. Um, your latest Enveronics poll that comes out, uh, in which you're uh, quite familiar with, obviously, um, Let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, what are the numbers showing in, in what Canadians are voicing objections now? What are we seeing? Well, what, we've, what we saw in the, like, Enver Rocks has been doing the same poll for about almost 30 years. So they have a really, and they've been asking the same core questions, four core questions for the past period. So we have a really good tracking over it opinion over time. And the one th insight from the last poll was a dr showed a drop of about 17%, if I remember correctly, of those who thought that the immigration levels were fine. It's now sort of, it's dropped, it, that number dropped 17%. And so that's showing that the concerns over housing, health care, and the impact of immigration have started to register with the Canadian uh, public. Um, and it's still not a bad, the overall number is still reasonably strong compared to some other countries. But it's that shift that actually is a bit of a wake up call that, wait a minute, Canadians aren't against immigration per se, because the, the other data shows that pretty clearly. But they are concerned about the numbers that are coming in and the impact that has on Canadian society to adapt and uh, and to succeed. I wanted to pivot a bit to the citizenship um, component uh, to the large concept of immigration. Uh, there's been some controversy of late uh, on on the citizenship and and the actual oath taking process. Um, it's becoming more virtual, it seems, uh, and I wanted to hear qualitatively. Uh, what are your thoughts on? Uh, I understand you 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 were uh, put together a very important petition that uh, received uh, signatures and and fifteen hundred is I believe uh, what your number came up to. Uh, what exactly is the issue for for listeners? Well, there are sort of two separate issues. Um, so let's start with the oath question is whether you actually have to state the oath in front of a citizenship judge along with your peers, or you can just sort of do a tick off on a box saying, yes, I've read the oath and I, you know, sw basically swear, swear the oath virtually. Um, and so that's the one issue. And so the, by basically sort of just clicking yes, like you click on, you know, Amazon or something like that, it basically diminishes the value of stating the oath in front of your other new Canadians, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person, because that has a more meaning, it's more meaningful and it has a greater impact. The second issue is respect to virtual ceremonies versus in-person ceremonies. Now, IRCC had to move to virtual ceremonies during the pandemic. You know, that was that was, you know other countries did the same thing because there was no no real alternative. But it became a drug because it was easier for IRCC to do and to organize. Not necessarily e much easier for actually the people becoming citizens because the process of authentication was was difficult. And again, when I was in government, whenever I got a bit depressed, I would go to a citizenship ceremony because I would be among the people there in person and I would see their faces, I would see their family members, I would see their friends. And it was really a very powerful moment, not only for them, probably most importantly for them, but even for me as somebody who was responsible for the program. They said, this is why it all matters. This is why we have to put up with all the, the BS that goes along with the job, to be quite frank. Um, and virtually everybody who has gone to a ceremony feels the same way. I mean, there are some people who just, you know, just want to get it done and over with. It's, it's transactional. But for most people, they remember the ceremonies. They remember the judge. They remember what was said. 
because it's one of those things like a like a graduation or a wedding or a funeral it stays with you um so so i've argued in the petition that um, a the oath should be done not online you know not just by clicking something but you actually have to state it and secondly i've argued as well that the number of virtual ceremonies should be limited to about 10 percent or something like that to deal with those remote locations that you need to but otherwise the government should just invest in doing the in-person ceremonies but they have much more meaning and it's the one touch point that the federal government has that is a positive touch point with respect to immigrants because everything else is just pain you know no matter what you do or just the one time that you get to celebrate the journey that you've made it you're a canadian now right and it's a long journey because if you start from day one <clears throat> when you were a student or a temporary worker uh you know it for 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 many this is a a five to seven year journey and i think what you're touching on is the emotional uh, component to citizenship uh this emotional uh versus transactional uh they they're they're dumbing down this whole process to just a transactional uh, approach to becoming a canadian which, which really for so many people we we both know uh, how meaningful and impactful it is uh, at an emotional level, becoming a Canadian, having that passport. Uh, and I, it seems that uh, the policy makers here uh, have, have, you know, ignored this very significant uh, aspect of what it means to becoming a Canadian. And of course, uh, the, no, the, the word citizenship is loosely used by people who are not in the industry, they, they talk about, but, but citizenship by itself, what, for what it really is, uh, is, is the culmination of a journey uh, that that lasts uh, five, as I said, five to seven years, and and I tend to agree with you that this is this is something that uh, we need to uh, not e eliminate and and put into a dustbin and, and just a click of a, of a of a form. You've now good, you know, welcome. You you you've succeeded. Uh, transaction. All of these concepts um, eliminate and and dismiss. Uh, this very, very uh, m important part of becoming uh, a Canadian citizen. Uh, what's the process that now takes place? Uh, your views are, are obviously uh, uh, being uh, reviewed, and uh, what do you what do you take out of this? Do you think they'll back down on this uh, element of of the way they're heading forward? The political signals that from the minister have not been dismissive of the of the value of in-person ceremonies so i mean i think there both the extensive commentary by people like the former governor general former mayor of, Net, of uh, calgary etc i think have been listened to as well the petition has forces the government to address it and, and respond to it formally in parliament probably hopefully before the end of the year or early in the new year um and so I think they originally had thought they could just get it through. Um, and of course, um, that was a mis miscalculation because when people heard about it, you know, enough people got upset about it um, and the petition got enough signatures that it had to be listened to. Um, so I'm guardedly optimistic that there may be some rethinking going on because actually you know when they when they did their sort of analysis of the cost savings it was five million dollars um and five million dollars on a on a department that has a budget of over what is it 1.3 1.4 billion is a rounding error even in relation to the the budget just for settlement services you could take that money out of settlement service it wouldn't even be noticed right quite quite uh, interesting <laughs> on the uh, on that point of view as well uh well look this is a, an area that hopefully a small victory uh, perhaps uh, could could be uh, could be hopefully coming your our, our way on this point um andrew really interesting topics um no solution in sight, but uh, I'm sure we'll see uh, uh, more more discussion uh, on all these topics um, in the new year. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure.
If you enjoyed today's episode, leave a review, share it with your friends, and subscribe for more insights into the ever-changing world of immigration. Remember, this podcast is just a starting point. For more information, check out immigration.ca, the leading website resource for information on immigration to Canada. And if you're serious about making the move, be sure to fill out our free online evaluation form to find out if you are eligible. We also invite you to subscribe to immigration.ca's weekly newsletter, where you will stay informed with the most trusted Canadian immigration news and resources straight into your inbox. Join us next time on Migrate Canada.